You're listening to Forward Faster, bite-sized insights for entrepreneurs. Welcome to NextCore's podcast series. I'm here today with Dr. Jean-Philippe Coderre. And when you hear him, you'll obviously know he is not from Rochester. Uh, But why don't you tell us a little bit about what brought you to Rochester? Uh, thank you, Lynn, for this question, and uh, hello, everyone. And I came to Rochester, actually, for a postdoctoral studies. I actually uh, did my PhD in France, and as you uh, charmingly noted, I have this accent that basically uh, comes from France. It's not a Canadian accent. It's a well, French it's, accent. it's good. It's not the Rochester <laughs> twang that we have. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, after my, uh, my PhD, I decided to do a postdoc. I didn't want to stay in France. I wanted to have a little bit of experience outside of uh, Europe, and and I was really targeting to come to uh, America and and was very excited about any kind of opportunities I could find. And I actually applied to many institutions. I just, you know, ended my PhD. I had a couple of publications. I was really going into the academic career and, and, and really uh, trying to, um, you know, build some experience, not only nationally, but now internationally. And I applied in San Francisco. I applied, actually, went to Australia, to Sydney. I applied to Montreal in mm. Canada uh, and to Rochester. And I was actually, I had a chance to be accepted everywhere but in Sydney because uh, they asked me actually to come for an interview. And at this time, it was a little bit of a challenge to go there from France. So I decided to uh, just uh, target on uh, the U.S. So San Francisco, the laboratory where uh, they offer me a position, was obviously a very exciting place. San Francisco is a fantastic oh, city. Yeah. But the, the laboratory, unfortunately, didn't have a, a very good reputation. They were not doing a lot of good publication. Literature was a little bit poor. It was not very attracting place. The city was attracting, but the laboratory for doing research was not. And I was accepted also in Rochester. And in Rochester, there is this laboratory that was called at this time the Heart Research Follow-Up Program. That was actually a a world-renowned laboratory for research in certain type of cardiac diseases. Mm -hmm. And specifically, uh, what is called the long QT syndrome, which is a genetic disease where actually the patients have a prolongation of the uh, recovery phase of the heart and creates a lot of problems. They die very early. And there were a lot of publications, a lot of activities. So I really told myself, you know, let's go to Rochester. Okay, it's not a very well-known city, but let's go for two years. I'm going to do a postdoc, and then you know we'll find what what life has for me. So I came actually in January '97 with my wife, newly married. Mm-hmm. We were married for a couple of weeks, so we already came to Rochester <laughs> for our honeymoon. And uh, I have been actually in Rochester now for 21 years. So the honeymoon never stopped. That's exactly my point. Whoa. But I'll tell you, I didn't stay in Rochester because of that only. Okay. I actually stayed in Rochester because I found an amazing city. And it's really what happened. Rochester, uh, in a sense, when you arrive and you look at it, it's not very attracting in a way. It's, it looks like a small city. And when you know no, not a lot of people and you come, uh, you're a little bit, I would say, um, you know, wondering what, what's going on here. Well, why, why actually the, the people are coming here? What's going on? And then when you start, you know, working here, when you start interacting with people, when you start going to the north to see the lake, you realize that this is a beautiful place. Mm. This is a place where you have a lot of people with uh, very uh, high educations. You have a lot of you know, opportunities to build things, not only at the University of Rochester, where I was coming from my postdoc, but also at the Rochester Institute of Technology. There, there, there is a lot of different colleges. So there's a life in this city that is actually quite amazing. And it's very unexpected when you come. And when you realize that and you see that, you don't want to leave. You want to stay. Mm. The quality of life is fantastic. The people are very welcoming. 
And again, there's a lot of opportunities, and obviously one of them was uh, Luminate, the Luminate program. Right. Well, let's talk about Luminate in a minute, mm. but obviously it's a rich city for discovery and innovation. So mm. tell us a little bit about the HealthCam uh, technology that you've developed and what it really means for, for patients that are dealing with heart disease. Sure. So, so the HealthCam technology is a software technology, and we are pushing that to be a software as a medical device. The software is uh, really interesting uh, because it uses the cameras from smart devices like your phone, your tablets, your uh, laptops, and, and any computer device today has actually a camera. And when you load this software, the software actually uh, contains a lot of technology around face recognition, mm -hmm. around measurement of variation of the color of the skin. I'm going to explain uh, why we need that. So first, we do face detection. So we detect it's a face from somebody. Uh, we don't want to do that on, you know, an animal or something yeah, like I that. Yeah, I know my dog, Gracie, is always looking at <laughs> exactly. my iPad saying, hey, and when you go, you know, you go, when, when you go, these devices, you know, they are all over the place. They are in your house. You never know what can happen. So in a sense, we have a software that detect, detect that this is a human face, and then it detects who, who you are, okay? So we have a process where we have not only face detection, but uh, face identification. And when you, we know who you are, and basically most of the time it is actually the owner of the device, we actually use the camera to measure the cardiac activity of the people using the devices. The way we do it, and it's why I, 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 I talk about you know, variation of the color of the skin, is that we actually enhance very subtle changes in the color of the skins that occurs on each cardiac beat. What does it mean? It means that each time your heart beats, there is changes in the blood volume underneath the skin. Mm -hmm. okay? Okay. And because the face has this very thin skin, Basically, the refraction and reflection of the light is modulated by this volume of blood. So what happens is that there is a blushing phenomenon that occurs on a bit-to-bit -bit basis, but that is so subtle that we cannot see it with a naked eye. Okay? And our technology detects these subtle changes of the color, and I would call it a blushing phenomenon. Okay. So it's like when people blush, but this is really on a bit-to-bit -bit basis. So not to be confused with my hot flash. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And, 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 but that's the same, you know, phenomenon in a thing about when people right. are blushing is because, you know, their heart rate increase, their heart is be be beating harder, and they become red, and, uh, you know, the stress and, and talking and all these things, you know, do that. But this phenomenon occurs each time your heart beats. So each time your heart is going to push the blood through your organisms, there is these changes of the color. And it does not, you know, it, it is the same regardless of the color of the skin of the individual. And in a sense, what our technology does, it does detect these subtle changes. And by measuring these changes, we can actually monitor the heart of the people using these devices. But what is really unique is that we are doing that in the background. Think about digital health technology today. Everything is about wearables. Okay, mm -hmm. buy a beautiful watch that is going to tell you what's going to happen every day, every minute of your life right. uh, and, and measure you and monitor you all the time. Buy, buy a patch that you put on your, on your torso to measure your heart. Now they have basically this belt. So you have all these garments actually that you can buy today. The problem with these devices is that they are garments. It means that there are mm. things you need to buy. You need to recharge every day, you need to put on yourself, you need to actually wear to have the information. The uniqueness of our technology is that you don't need that. So you minimize or get rid of any of the behavior change then that's necessary exactly. just by using your, your smart device that you would use all throughout your day. Exactly. Think about how wow. much time you spend every day okay. on your phone. Okay, In average, it's two to three hours for somebody active. For the people that are a little bit more sedentary and, and like this technology, they may spend six, seven hours a day in front of a computer, in front of their laptop, in front of, of a tablet or, or their phone. Each minute they spend on the device, we do two measurements of their heart rate. So we do a measurement every 30 seconds. If somebody watch a TV series on Netflix, 
-hmm. Okay, yeah. imagine. We have basically more than hundreds of measurements of their heart while they are watching this, this movie. So what we are resolving, apart from the fact that we have a unique technology that monitor the people uh, passively, I would say, what really we have here is a technology that provide information without disturbing the life of the people. And when you look at how people behave, and specifically the people that have cardiac diseases, they have a lot of const constraints in their life. They have a lot of boundaries. They have to take all this medication. They have to make sure that you know, their life is well organized. Adding a device for monitoring at home is very constraining to them, okay? And more than 60% of the people that tries that actually abandon the device after a couple of months, mm. okay? For us, it doesn't matter. We load the software to their phone that they use every day, the software, and each time they, they put it on and they do something on, on it, we do a measurement. They don't even realize that we are doing that. And so then what happens to that information? Where does it go? So... Uh, you know, all these devices now are connected, right? Nobody has a device that is not connected to Internet. All the content is going through the Internet. So the software does the measurement on the device, and this measurement is, is, is sent to VPG Medical Cloud Server. Okay. okay. So we have actually a server that actually gather all the information from everybody using the device, and we have account for each user, and we acquire information every day about their heart and what's going on. So think about it. As soon as someone opt in, meaning download once the application, mm -hmm. then it's working forever. Okay? There's no limit, right? So every day of every week, of every month, we have actually measurement and we can follow what's going on with their heart. And if something changes, and we use, obviously, artificial intelligence. We use a lot of technology that identify normal patterns in people. Mm -hmm. And if something goes wrong, like, for example, progression of a disease, we have currently uh, ongoing clinical studies in heart failure patients. Okay? Heart failure patients have this very weak heart. They, they have to take drugs that slow down their heart. They are called beta blockers. And basically what happens is that when they don't take these drugs because they forget about it, because they don't have any drugs left, they need to go to the pharmacy or things like that, their heart is not controlled by the drug anymore and then goes very high. Mm, okay. And just seeing these kind of patterns with our technology permits to get an early detection of changes in the disease. And we can send this information to somebody that can do something about it, that can So intervene. like their doctor could have an intervention with them if they need exactly, to in terms exactly. of getting them back on the path, exactly. right? Exactly. Today, amazing. Today, more than one quarter of the people that receive these drugs actually do not take the drug. It's incredible because they know, everybody knows that these drugs are going to make their life mm -hmm. better quality. These drugs are going to actually prolong their life and reduce the number of time they go back to the hospital. Despite that, which is very well actually documented in the literature, one quarter of the people do not take their medication. Our technology can tell to their physician that they have not taken their medication. That is such a great impact uh, potential in terms of per maybe perhaps saving a quarter of the population that has heart disease before uh, sure, they sure. have another heart episode. Exactly. We believe that this technology is just a simple software technology will actually save life. And if it is distributed at, this, the, you know, at a large scale, it can save millions of lives. That's so we are so excited about this technology because we believe we have a key to increase the quality of life of people again and to maybe save lives of people that would end up in the hospital because they just forget their drug. But somebody could tell, call them at the right time and say, did you forget your drug? Maybe you should take it. Or do you need a refill of your drug? You know, mm -hmm. so, so this information, the flow of information, it's what I believe digital health technology can do. Creating new information to the right people to create value for the physician and to create value for the patients. 
That's fascinating. So are you seeing, in terms of this type of health monitoring, and you're looking at the trends that are out there, uh, do you see more uh, uh, technology innovation heading towards these, I would say, um, non-wearable type of applications? Um, is it, and is that something that you're looking at maybe perhaps expanding beyond this one potential application? Definitely. And I can tell you I was actually in Washington just last week for a meeting uh, with people from the NIH, from the FDA, and from VARU, uh, various uh, research institutes at the FarmD Foundation uh, downtown in D.C. And that was exactly the objective of this meeting with all these people. We are 30 people that are experts in different fields. And the question is, where are we going with this digital health technology? What is actually useful? How can we get re what they call real world data and real world evidence that the digital technology can provide today for us valuable information, okay? The discussion goes on. It was like a six hours meeting. It was very interesting. But what came, up, uh, came out of this meeting was very, very clear, is that the future of digital health monitoring is into what we call opportunistic monitoring and passive monitoring. Again, people are not compliant, at least long term. Mm -hmm. They are not compliant with these devices, with these technologies. We need to put sensors everywhere, in the bathroom. We need to put it in their chair where they spend 30% of their time. We need to put them in their phone that they look at for a couple of hours every day. That's where the technology should go. And if wearables are fantastic and can do a great job in wellness application, I believe, mm -hmm. For the people that have chronic diseases, that have a lot of constraints in their life, they are not the good solution. Hmm. That's fascinating. You know, I, I always am perplexed why people know better, but they just don't do it. And that's the behavioral change problem that, that faces that's a true. lot of things from medical to climate change. Um, now, I find it fascinating because I know you and I've had the pleasure of working with you in the last six months um, in the Luminate program. You were able to take advantage of the startup accelerator in Luminate, and you actually won $500,000 plus the $100,000 um, initial funding that mm -hmm. they gave you. Um, what has that meant to VPG Medical, and, and how has it helped uh, kind of fuel your progression in getting this technology to market? Well, that was crucial to the development of the company, obviously, and anybody that has started, to, that has started a startup knows that the first challenge is to find funds and to find the resources to develop your ideas and your concept, okay? Through hiring the right people, through creating your team, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I can tell you that that's not my first startup. That's my second startup. I, I did the first one in 2006 that was sold 11 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, I had a little bit of experience. So when I came to Luminate, for me, what Luminate was offering was clearly, clearly something extremely valuable because I went through this process of starting a company and understanding what are the challenges. The money is very important. I mean, that's clear, okay? This is basically what you need to, to create your foundation and, 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 and to make sure that you, you have the resources to develop your ideas. This is fundamentally what you need to start. Right. But then, as you know very well, Illuminate is not only money. Illuminate is much more than that. Illuminate is education, is a training program, is, is formation of, of your team, is, 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 is a lot of things that when you have to do it by yourself, <laughs> you know, just in your right. corner, in your garage or at the library, mm -hmm. uh, takes a much more time, much more effort. So what, you know, Illuminate just facilitated everything for us. And I can tell you, one year and what is now 15 months, I should say, 15 months ago when we started, we were three in the companies. Okay. In the company. Today we have 12 people. Okay? That's awesome. And uh, we are pushing our technology to people, to patients in, in Western New York at this point. And this is very exciting. The role of Luminate has been crucial. No question about it. So what advice... Given the fact that you started a company already and sold it, and now you're on to your second one, what yeah. advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are trying to take this path? Well, uh, uh, you know, to have a lot of energy, okay? This is very important. You have to believe in what you do. That's 
that, that is obvious, obviously, <laughs> but, 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 you, sorry, but you need, you really need to believe in what you do because you need all the energy you have to develop what you, you want. That's probably the, 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 the first thing. It's, it's draining. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of when things. When you are depleted of energy, where do you get that inspiration to keep you going? Well, you, you basically, uh, when, when you feel that, and it's, uh, it's happened very, very often, you know, you always enter what is called the, the, valley, the, the valley of death, okay? Mm-hmm. And basically, you have to be resourceful. You have to find, basically, solution to your problem that you face every day. And sometimes you can't, okay? And sometimes you fail. I believe there's no success without failure, okay? I believe that, it too. It is very important. Failure create actually your expertise, your experience, mm-hmm. and drive you to success. Right. If you are depleted, if you feel that things do not work the way it is, you know, just do something else. Have a nice glass of French wine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, take your rest and then Wait go back. Wait a minute. <laughs> You're in Rochester. You should be saying Finger Lakes wine now. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Some of them are extremely good. Uh, but, you know, uh, yes, there, there are challenges, but it's true for everybody. Okay. Uh, in life, nothing is easy and there are challenges. And this is pretty, uh, but you just have to go for it and, and believe in what you do. And very importantly, for a startup, have a great team. Everything is in the team. Yeah. Okay. You cannot do things by yourself uh, today. There are too many things happening. You need to find the right people. And I recommend to anybody who wants to do a startup to spend a lot of time on selecting the people they work with. Yeah. It is so, so fundamental. Crucial, right? It's so crucial. Yeah. You have to create a culture in your company that is you know, driving people to improve themselves, to be happy, to come every day and make sure that they do the best they can. And to do that, you have to put the right people with the right people and make sure that you you know these people. And, and, and I can tell you, you spend a lot of time on that. And, but I think that any investment of effort at the beginning in creating this team, if it's well done, will drive, you know, the success of your organization. In terms of success... Fast forward 10 years, where would you like to be? What do you see for yourself or for B- B- VPG Medical? Well, in 10 years, VPG Medical, hopefully, I hope that uh, you'll have a little icon on your phone and your tablet that actually uh, tells you that your heart is monitored each time you use it. Okay, that's, that's our objective. Again, we want to push this technology. We want to save life of people. So in 10 years, we'll be clearly FDA cle- cleared, uh, we'll have hopefully different type of diagnosis, uh, automatic diagnostic of disease. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that uh, this will be used by millions of people all over the world. Then things. Or maybe I'll be working on my third startup. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Could be. Could be. <laughs> well, stay tuned for that if that's the case. But I thank you so much, JP, for thank joining you. us today. And uh, especially to... since I'm going to be ready for retirement in about 10 years, I'm going to need that little icon on the screen just to make sure that I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.